Your church gathers, Lord, in Virginia and Mozambique, in Brazil and to the ends of the earth. Your church gathers, Lord, in city and country, in suburbs and slums, in sanctuaries and buildings, under trees and by streams of water. Your people gather to praise you, Lord, in English and Portuguese, with organ and guitar and drum, with voices of young and old, with song, with silence, with dance and with prayer. Your people praise you, Lord, for hope in the midst of despair, for strength in times of weakness, for justice in situations of oppression, for courage in the face of fear, for life in the midst of death. We are the people who call you Lord. Let everything that breathes praise you, Lord. Please be seated. Lord God, your love for humankind present in the beginning of all things extends throughout history and touches even my life. Your love sees failings and forgives. Your love feels pain and wipes away our tears. Your love knows grief and comforts the sorrowful. Your love sees sin and still loves the sinner. Forgive us when we fail to live that reflect your love. Forgive us the many times when we take for granted all that you have done for us. Transform us through your spirit and empower us to serve you this day and all days. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 23, verse 37 to chapter 24, verse 2. Jerusalem, Jerusalem the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. As Jesus came out of the temple and was going away, his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. Then he asked them, you see all these, do you not? Truly, I tell you, not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Through these Sundays of Lent, we are looking at the events of the last week of Jesus' life. On the first Sunday of Lent, we looked at Jesus in the temple, where I asked us to consider it more a protest than a tantrum when Jesus confronts the leadership there and overturns the tables in the temple. And last Sunday, we looked at Jesus addressing the Pharisees and found even in those harsh words a high ideal for a spiritual life. And this morning, I want to look at that very brief passage that we read where Jesus laments over the city of Jerusalem. Now, as Matthew tells the story, he doesn't fix a place for us. We don't know where in the city Jesus stood. But from my time walking through that ancient city, I saw that Jerusalem is built on the top of uh, many, many hills. And from just about anywhere in the city, you can get to a high point and have a large vista of the city. 
So it's not hard for me to imagine Jesus standing in one of those places and looking out at the life of the city. And when he laments that Jerusalem is a city that kills the prophets and stones those who have been sent to them, well, there's just a higher level of urgency in Jesus' lament because he's the next prophet on the list. And by this point in the story, Jesus knows full well that the conflict with the leaders will end with his death. So at one level, he weeps a very personal weep, a lament. But there's something else. He weeps because he knows the city of Jerusalem has another option. They don't have to do what they are about to do. They could have made a different choice. Oh, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you the way a mother hen gathers her brood under her wing. But you would not. Part of the lament that Jesus shares is the disappointment. Not just what will happen to him, but what always seems to happen when our cruelty toward one another gets out of hand. And remember that the Gospel of Matthew is written somewhere between the years 85 and 90 in the Common Era, probably 40 years after Jesus' death. and probably some 15 years after the Romans had destroyed the city of Jerusalem. For they came in and they tore up the temple and they wreaked havoc throughout the city. And maybe, <clears throat> maybe Matthew is crying through Jesus' eyes in this story crying for what happened, crying that human warfare causes great pain. Now, a rather large number of biblical scholars tell us that there is a consistent structure to a lament in the Bible. They start with an acknowledgement of pain. Jesus is acknowledging how much it hurts in that moment. Well, painful things happen to all of us along life's journey. And when painful things happen, there's really only one thing we can do, and that is to let the pain be. I have a friend I talk to every now and then, and she will tell me, I have a lot of people who I talk to every now and then, and they tell me about their painful events. And uh, one of the hardest things to learn to do is to not rush in too quickly and try to comfort to try not to say, there, there, everything will be all right. If we can quell our impulse to minimize and to reassure, we can give people the grace and the freedom to work through their own pain. 
I read a book by a therapist once, and I came across a marvelous line. The writer says, there's really, really only one thing you can do with a feeling, and that is to feel it. So I said that to my friend, and a little bit later on, I was lamenting and complaining about something, and she said back to me, well, you know, Peter, there's really only one thing you can do with a feeling. <laughs> and I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> If someone you care about is in pain, resist the impulse to try to fix it for them. Just listen. Trust them to move through their own pain. The second part of a lament is when we ask God for help. We don't really see that in Jesus' lament over Jerusalem, but I believe such is present in Matthew's mind as he tells the story. Even if you don't know what God can do, even if you're not sure how God can act, even if you cannot see a way forward. Just telling God that you need help might make a big difference in your journey. And the third part of a lament is coming to a place of trust once again. We see that in Jesus' lament over the city of Jerusalem when he says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord that even though Jesus is in this great place of emotional pain, even though he has cried out to God for help, at some deep level he understands that the awfulness of that present day is not the last word. He dares to imagine a future, even through his tears, that is blessed, that is good. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, and I think he weeps over it still. For every life that is lost, in a centuries-old conflict. Jesus weeps for every settlement built and every contribution to unresolved conflict. And Jesus weeps for other cities as well. You know, the recent attack that happened in London hit me a little harder than most. And that's because it wasn't that long ago that Kathy and I were on that very street. We, uh, we rode the Piccadilly Line. That really is the name of the subway line in London. And uh, got out at Westminster Square. And just as you got out of the subway, there's this towering clock, Big Ben, and it, I wasn't expecting it, and it was quite awe-inspiring. And then there was the British Parliament, where the birthplace of modern democracy, and just down the road was Westminster Cathedral. We went to an organ concert there, and the guy was pretty good, but he was no Ken, Man no Ken Gallagher. <laughs> 
And right across the street from Westminster Cathedral is Methodist Central Hall, where so much of our denomination's work throughout the world uh, has been planned and so much of our Methodist identity is celebrated and encouraged. And all of those images came flooding through my mind as I heard the report of a man in a car and a knife and the death on the streets of London. We weep for London. Jesus weeps for Washington. I hope you'll forgive me a little sidetrack into cynicism, but uh, as I watched the debates unfold in Washington this week, I, I was kind of reminded of a story that, well, it just makes me think of what we do. There was this uh, very, very affluent city person who, who decided it was time for a vacation. And uh, he wanted to go pheasant hunting. So he went out to the store and he, he bought a brand new shotgun and a nice blaze orange jacket and some new boots and some appropriate attire. Hopped on a plane and went out to Kansas and started walking through the cornfields pheasant hunting. Now, before he left, his colleagues in the office had teased him, saying that uh, he wouldn't bring any pheasants back, and he assured them that he would. He was getting down to the last day, and he didn't have a pheasant yet. And as he was walking through the cornfield, he flushed a pheasant, and up it flew, and he took his shotgun, and he followed it, and he, he shot the pheasant, and the pheasant fell to the ground, and he followed the trajectory of where the pheasant had gone. And it fell just on the other side of a fence. So he carefully climbed over the barbed wire fence. And as he was reaching down to pick up a pheasant, he heard this roar of a tractor. And this Kansas farmer came up and said, stop, that's my pheasant. It fell on my property. You don't have a right to it. He was a little bit taken aback and uh, they went back and forth and argued about who was the rightful owner of this pheasant. And finally the Kansas farmer said, well, I'll tell you what, let's settle this with the Kansas kick rule. Well, what's that? He said, well, I kick you and you kick me and the first person on the ground loses and the other gets the fence, the pheasant. So this guy from the city was in pretty young, pretty good, pretty good shape. He looked at the Kansas farmer and he thought, eh, I think I could win this match. So they begin. And the guy from Kansas kicks him first. It hurts, he doubles over a little bit, his eyes water, but he doesn't fall to the ground. And he says, okay, Paps, now it's my turn. And he looked down at his new boots, and just as he was about to kick, the Kansas farmer said, no, that's it, I quit. <laughs> you can have the pheasant. I never really wanted it. All I wanted to do was kick you. <laughs> and sometimes that's how I feel when I look at the governance in Washington today. It seems like we're more interested in kicking one another than we are constructing a national life of which we can be proud and that serves a common good. Jesus weeps for Washington as do we all. And Jesus weeps for Syria. And he weeps for what's left of Aleppo and Mosul. 
You know, I'm very, very proud of the youth of our church. They are going about this work of gathering health kits. Some of those could very well end up in Syria. Some of those could help the people of Syria put their lives back together. I know it's a very, very small contribution in the face of an urgent crisis. But maybe one act of kindness, one expression of care, will make a difference. I'm proud of them, and I'm glad for each one of us that has participated in expressing our hopes. In his book, Beyond Words, Frederick Beekner writes about tears. You never know what will cause them. The sight of the Atlantic Ocean can do it, or a piece of music, or a face you've never seen before, a pair of somebody's old shoes could do it. You can never be sure. But of this, you can be sure. Whenever you find tears in your eyes, especially the unexpected tears, it is well to pay close attention. They are not only telling you something about the secret of who you are, but more often than not, God is speaking to you through them of the mystery of where you have come from and is summoning you to where, if your soul is to be saved, you should go next. Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. He poured out his pain for the injustice that would befall him and the injustices that befall so many. He asked for help. Even though he wasn't sure of what that help would be. And he kept buried deep within the core of his being a promise that the disappointment and the hardship of the present moment would not be the last word on the journey of his life and of our lives. Amen. Now may that peace of God that passes all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you.